Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Judith Ailey, Cassandra Del Vicio, and Scott Norman from NBC News Archives. <laughs> And then Stephanie Jenkins, Florentine Films, will be guiding our conversation. Good morning, everybody. All right. Welcome. Um, okay, so we're really lucky to have these panelists here to talk about the beginning of the archival process. Um, I'm curious, it's pretty bright, but I'm curious who here has licensed archival for a documentary before. Okay, so a few of you. Um, if I say the word screener, does that mean stuff to people? Okay, a couple of you kind of got a thumbs up. Some people really love screeners. Um, and who here has handled 16 millimeter film? All right, some of you. Um, just trying to gauge, yeah, kind of where we're, where we're getting started here. Um, okay, so, I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves. I'm Judy Ailey. I am a very long time. First, when I started, I was just called an archival researcher. Now I'm called an archival producer. And God knows what the next title will be. But um, I've been doing this really since the mid 1990s. And I have worked on several Michael Moore films. I work very regularly with Spike Lee. I worked on The Price of Everything with Nathaniel Kahn. And I'm now working on a four-part series. The new, the new wave of documentary is, seems to be all series. And I'm working on a four-part series for HBO on the Atlanta Child Murders. That sounds really cool, actually. Um, I'm Cassandra Del Vicio. I own Edgework Studios. We are a uh, visual effects, animation, and motion graphics company that specializes in documentary. Uh, we do mostly documentary features as well as a lot of documentary television. Uh, lots and lots of PBS, Nova, science television, and history television. Um, so we run the gamut from everything from working with someone like Stanley Nelson to doing things for PBS Nova and creating black holes, which are not archival, but it's where we basically uh, kind of go everywhere from 3D animation to motion, just motion graphics. And sometimes even that 3D animation deals with archival. Um, I'm Scott Norman. Um, I'm sales and rights manager at uh, NBC News Archives. I've been in the business um, as long or longer than, than Judy. We worked together back uh, back way in the, the 90s. Um, besides NBC, I've worked at um, BBC as well here in New York, licensing out of um, their archive. Um, I've, I've done various things over the years you know, in the business between research and sales and, and content. Um, but it's mostly been in the broadcast uh, archive side of things. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically what we'll do. Awesome. And I'm Stephanie Jenkins. I'm a producer with Ken Burns. I've uh, archival produced and produced um, Central Park Five, Jackie Robinson. I'm currently doing an eight hour series on Muhammad Ali. Um, yeah. And so we're going to start by just showing the NBC uh, archival reel that. Um, yeah. So what's cool about that reel is you see archival is a whole range of stuff from AOC to JFK to everything. And the process for licensing these different types of things is, is quite different because they all come from um, original formats that vary, different turnaround times to get this stuff. Um, they've been transferred at different times. So um, yeah, we're going to start with that. And just so you guys know, we'll, we'll have 25 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so please prepare you know, any specific questions you may have about your projects for this panel. So Judy, we're going to get started. What is an archival producer? Um, an archival producer is really, in the, in the best of all worlds, a creative collaborator in the process of making your film. and. Um, what an archival producer does is really take responsibility and initiative in thinking about 
really any third party material that you want to bring into your film that you have to license or something we're not going to talk about here, make fair use of, but a person who oversees your whole strategy for finding third party material, doing the research to find it and figuring out what to do in terms of clearances and budget. And uh, one thing I really advise is don't make your archival budget before you've talked to somebody with experience because you will just have a really difficult finish. <laughs> so, can you um, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you've worked on so many different kinds of projects. When someone approaches you for a project as an archival producer, how do you get started in making a budget and just in general looking at um, how long things will take, kind of setting a course for an archival workflow? Okay, wow, big, big questions. Um, or, so, or you can, yeah. are there any specific projects you'd well, like to well, say how you approach it? what I would say is that for me, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. People come to me because they know about me and, you know, they hopefully want a fairly high level of involvement. I occasionally jump into a project to help with a thorny problem, but, um, you know, I think the first thing for me is to really usually sit down with the director and if there's a strong producer involved, the producer, and to really get a sense of the film, what, what they already know about archival material that they want, to also get a sense of how heavy the archival coverage is going to be, because, you know, you, I'm working on a film now where we probably have 85% archival coverage. It's very, very heavy. So in this case, we actually have two archival producers on, two archive you know, associate producers, and we're basically all on for the whole project, and we came in as part of pre-production because part of the pre-production was really to assess how much archival there was and what our strategy was going to be for bringing it in, for thinking about the budget. And they made the budget without me and, you know, they're suffering. So, <laughs> um, anyway, I think it's, it's an important thing for directors and producers to think about is how much archival do you want and where do you think it might come from and, you know, one of the things that I try to encourage people to do is, it, it's fine, I've, I've now come to accept that people go prospecting on YouTube, but what you can find on YouTube or on the web or in somebody else's documentary is always stuff that anybody can see anytime. And it, it, instead of falling in love with what you find in your first search, to think about that as the starting point. Something like this or something that has this feeling. Some archival is very literal, you actually need the event. Some archival is atmospheric or is sort of as for because there isn't archival material of the actual event. Um, you can structure an archival budget in a couple of ways. You can have an experienced person come in at the beginning to help you budget, strategize, and kind of set things up and work, say, with an AP who has to be interested in archival to kind of set up a process and a system for moving through the whole project. And then if you're doing it that way, I think you have someone come in at intervals, you know, a, at rough cut to analyze it, start problem solving again at fine cut. And then when you get to a soft picture lock, a soft picture lock, four to eight weeks before your real picture lock, you have someone come back in and really look at clearances, consolidating sources, substituting shots to save money, all of that. If you have someone on full-time, that's full-time, so. Thank you. No, no, that was perfect. Um, Scott, when do you suggest filmmakers <laughs> come to archives uh, when they're working on a project? Yeah. The, the earlier, the better. I mean, what Judy described, I mean, I think is, um, you know, ideal to bring in someone, you know, experienced or at least having someone throughout the process. Um, what you'd like to avoid, and I think it's, it does become harder for, for filmmakers um, to do at times because there is so much content available to view on the, on the web. 
Um, so what often happens is, well, we're just gonna like take stuff off the web and use that and this is, you know, this is great. We don't have to really reach out to anybody and you get further into the process way down the line and then you realize, so, you know, we actually have to try to license some of this stuff and the quality is pretty bad on this. And it's amazing the amount of productions then that are under a heavy uh, deadline pressure to all of a sudden like, you know, we need to get this done. And then they bring in someone who's experienced to try to kind of clean things up at that point. Um, and it just makes it difficult on everyone's, you know, everyone's part. I mean, if you're working on a, on a project where you know it's gonna be um, heavy archival, um, you know, involved, so you wanna to try to talk to, you know, some of the main sources, you know, early on kind of, again, discussing a little bit about the project, you know, what you're kind of looking for as far as, you know, um, the amount that you're looking for and also the types of material you're looking for. You're looking for kind of, b-roll material are you looking for actual news coverage with reporters and anchors things like that so you want to get a sense you know early on what the pricing you know is and what you know how much research time would be involved in trying to find everything like that um, and also i think that um, you know at that point depending on what your project is you know most places would you know like to talk to you about you know perhaps you know giving you an idea of um, you know discounts at that point even if you end up using you know, a certain amount of minutes worth of material, you know, you can lower prices that way, where, you know, if you come in at the end of a project, kind of, you know, uh, that you, you know, that's never the, the best time usually to talk, um, you know, overall discount. So it's, it's better from, a, you know, I think from first the research end of things, but also kind of a, the, you know, the, the sales and pricing aspect of it to try to, try to get a sense earlier, earlier on in the project. Um, then wait until the last moment of things, yeah. Great, and when an archival producer approaches you, how do you know when someone's done their homework versus when someone is has not done their homework? Um, yeah, that's... Uh, or like, what what's an ideal way to approach an archive as from an archive uh, perspective? What do you like when we approach you? Right, I mean, with? most people, I mean, traditionally they start off with some kind of wish list of, things that they're looking for. Um, and, you know, at the, at the beginning of a project, I mean, that can be usually a fairly, you know, large list, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it comes from brainstorming sessions and things like that. But it, but it is good to put down an idea of what, you know, you're kind of looking for. And again, because there's different types of material out there um, that, you know, as Judy was saying, there's some things that are they're going to be contextual, you know, um, other things are really specific events, you know, do you have this that happened on this date? Um, but what's, but giving like an idea of initially what you're looking for and when you talk to, to um, an archive, um, you know, usually like they can also make suggestions. I mean, I think what's always interesting is often people don't really know what they're looking for um, exactly. They have some ideas, but you know, sometimes when you talk with them, then they'll, or suggest things that, you know, well, this, you're not gonna be able to find something like this, but we have this and this might work for you. I mean, that's happened a lot over the years. Um, so organization though, like for anything, is, 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 is always a great thing through any of the, any of the process. But, but putting together an idea of, of kind of what you're looking for, realistically, you know, what your, your, your time frame is, when do you hope to get like a rough cut together? Are you gonna be going to film festivals first? Um, you know, those kinds of basic things. Um, and, and also just, you know, realistically, you know, budget wise, you know, that always has to be a discussion, um, you know. And, and again, like depending on the amount of material involved and, and, you know, there are certain types of searches that may not be as difficult as others. So. You know, pricing, you know, is something that can always be, you know, discussed at least, you know, especially early on in a, in a, in a project. So, so knowing your budget, knowing the distribution, you know, what your goals are there um, are, are always good first steps. Great. Um, I'd like to talk about different um, kinds of archives. There are commercial news archives and then there are smaller, um, you know, university archives. Um, can you talk about... And actually, I brought a research list I sent to a smaller archive that I could bring up. That might be useful. Could you bring up the spreadsheet? 
Um, if I, ooh, spreadsheet. Um, I dream in spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the basic software that you have to have for an effective archival production is Excel and FileMaker Pro. You know, that, those are the things you really need. Google Sheets has really it's changed the game. Anyway, so just to explain what you're looking at, I am working on an eight-hour film about Muhammad Ali. This is a, um, a smaller archive, the University of Kentucky, UK. Um, they just have, as you can see on the top line, I think it's... A little distorted from down here. They only have archival from this from WAVE TV from 1966, 1967, or sorry, seven to 71, and then 1975. So what I did is I took all of these local dates where I knew that Muhammad Ali was in Louisville, which is the local station of WAVE TV, and I gave them this spreadsheet. Because what I'm dealing with in an archive like this smaller archive is they. Um, just have boxes of 16 millimeter film that are not labeled, there are no shot lists, there's nothing, it's just reels of film. So the only way that they can track back to see if they have something is by date, and then maybe if they're lucky when they open this dusty box that hasn't been looked at since these things were shot in 1967, hopefully somebody at the station at the time hand wrote like Ali or at this point Clay. Um, and that's how we hope to track back to something and find a unique piece of footage that hasn't been used before. So, you know, that's the kind of thing if you're doing a deep dive, this takes a lot of time. I developed a research list based on a lot of local news research through newspapers.com and various other things. So that's the kind of thing if you're doing a deep dive that you would have to do. Um, and then I try to develop lists like this. Actually, Scott, I owe you a list <laughs> right now. Well, I mean, like, Ali um, is a good example of, of, you know, there is no shortage of Muhammad Ali material. I mean, someone said to me, yeah, he never met a camera he didn't like. He would always run to the camera. I mean, there's so much stuff on him. So where there's, there's some projects where the difficulty is, like, finding archival footage on a subject, or is there enough to really you know, do your project, you know, right. With Ali, there's so much stuff, and also so much stuff, though, that's been seen, you know, in the many different productions. So, like, what what Stephanie is, is attempting to do is, yeah, is to find stuff that, you know, for someone like me who would watch a documentary on Ali, Ali and I'm sure I will, when I watch it, I'll be like, wow, where did they get that? I mean, I've never seen that, you know, and that's on a, on a subject, like a well kind of covered subject, if you can still find things you know, that, that are unique is, I mean, that's difficult, but I mean, that, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be a, a great thing to Yeah, and there's actually a surprising amount of stuff that I, I didn't know going to this project. There's a surprising amount of stuff that hasn't been digitized, mm -hmm. um, which on such a well-covered subject has been really a surprise. Um, yeah, so I would. And I, I think just listening to what Stephanie is saying, Something that I consider really essential for a heavy archival project is really to build a basic timeline of the events of your story, the sort of who, what, when, and where, that then you can take and apply to all different places. And when I do research in newspapers.com, because say I want to go into W. W A V E. A V E. I think that's um, what this one is. You know, I, I add any detail. Yeah. My timeline gets insanely long, but then I have it all and I can go back and find it again. I don't have to go through, like, where's that wish list or where is the email that I wrote to someone. It's all in one place. And that timeline will not just serve your ar archival process, it will serve every part of your production. Yeah. It'll serve you in preparing interviews, it'll serve you in fact check, everything like that. Our editors the thing timeline. about working with the smaller archives is you have to allow time. Sometimes you have to allow um, for hiring arms and legs in the place where the research is being done. You know, WVAE, which I also just worked with, you know, I think for me, the guy was literally shooting, like he'd shoot some sample of the reels he was pulling with his cell phone, send it to me, and then if it looked like something we wanted, we would then pay to have the reel digitized. And all of that takes time, all of that takes money. Because most of the, you know, especially like on a local level, let's say, of uh, any kind of news station or, you know, there, 
there's not a designated person usually who's just like there to like help people who are calling in because they have an outside project. You know, a lot of times it's it's someone who is has a another job, you know, at the station, uh, and you know they're you know they're basically kind of you know this is it falls to them to kind of help out. So I, I you know, I'm sure like like anything else, kind of building a relationship and you know approaching it in a certain way, you know does go a long way, I think, with, with those kinds of deep dives. Yeah. You know, I first that's... contacted this archive eight months ago, and I still haven't gotten footage. Also, I've been trying to get stuff out of Kentucky, but with the governor's race, everyone has been ignoring my emails because they're too busy at these local news you know, networks. So that's, all this stuff is stuff to consider if, you're, you know, if your story is heavily news-based or around a certain area. like. If someone says they want to do an Atlanta project, for an example, there are some great Atlanta archives. Yeah. No, we're very lucky in Atlanta to have, um, first of all, the University of Georgia, the, the Brown Media Archive, has really been at the forefront of local news preservation initiatives for probably, you know, at, I would say 20 years, I think. Um, and they have very deep collections. They have a couple of different news film collections. They have the news video for the local ABC channel, but they also have filmmaker thing, co collections. They have home movies, and they're very, very well organized, and they're very fast. And if you start with them, you think, oh, this isn't going to be so hard. <laughs> and then you get to you know, W. VAE. Sometimes you don't really know. Sometimes the film is held somewhere or the video is held somewhere, but the clearance has to happen in another place. This is an example of that. And I had an example of that in, I think, Pittsburgh, where there's a great local news collection that belongs to a big media company. And what you find out is, even though there's all kinds of fascinating, promising footage in this collection, it's essentially unlicensable because of both the pricing and the license agreement. And that's another thing you need to think of when you start to dig into these more obscure sources is even if I find it, am I going to be able to use it and afford it so that you don't go very far down a road that's going to be a dead end, as is the case for this collection in Pittsburgh, or Detroit, Pittsburgh, no Pittsburgh. Is it Hearst? Yeah, it's Hearst. <sighs> It's um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about organization. It, how's everybody doing? It's a lot of information. Everyone's OK. I've got a couple nods. Um, I want to talk a little bit about organization. And also, Cassandra, if you want to hop in on any of this stuff. We actually come in very late in the process a lot of the time. I mean, in terms of budgeting, I would just say that when you guys are talking to archival producers, you should also, if you think that your archival is going to play a strong visual role in your film, you should be reaching out to people like us at the same time. Because once you, while you're budgeting how you're going to buy that archival, and then think, oh, you need to think about what it's going to cost to treat it in a way that you can use it. I mean, if you're doing something very simple, a lot of times if you have a great editor, um, that you probably don't need someone like us. If you are trying to somehow uh, integrate this into a larger visual statement, or as Judith, we were talking before, if you have a little bit of archival and you're trying to plug a hole in your story and or, or try to explain something in your story, you, you definitely want to integrate us into that conversation very early on so that you can start to um, you know, think about not just the uh, financial implications, but scheduling and how we fit into your edit and into your into your design process, um, because we can affect that. The other thing I'll say before you guys get into organization is that I never talk to these guys. <laughs> you know, we never talk to the archival producers. Um, you would think that we would, but we don't. We these guys are. Um, kind of your librarians, obviously, um, and and very yeah. rarely are we, I mean, a lot of times where we're integrated is when there's a problem at the end, when, um, oh, I think my mic died. Did it? Oh. Um, the, at the end, if there's a problem with something where 
Um, it's, you know, they've got to go out and find something, uh, you know, they found out they couldn't use something or there's something where we've got it and it, you know, we can't use it because of the quality of the image or, or whatever it is that we're working with. Um, so just to kind of keep all that in mind as you're juggling all these other things. And just since we're going to segue into organization, Could I would bring say something the that's maker. really Oh, yeah, no, just just for them to look at. Okay. Um, something that's really crucial if you are working with a graphics house is to really deliver material to them that has come through the hands of your archival team, not like, oh, this shot that I just found on Google Images yeah. might be really good. I'm just going to send it to them just to sketch with because you know, that's that's a nightmare because whatever you do that with will turn out to be impossible to clear, I yeah. guarantee you. And it also gets and then expensive. everyone will be crying. So. Yeah, it gets expensive if you guys have us, if you haven't vetted something properly through your archivist and you, you think that we're definitely going to use this and we end up working with it and then you either find out you can't use it um, because you can't afford to buy it or you can't get the rights or it's not uh, high enough quality to use, then you have to pay out, that's, then you basically wasted money in your graphics budget where we have to then go back um, and recreate something or change something um, because you could, couldn't use it. I should say also, um, we're having a panel at 2.45. Uh, we're going to be talking with an editor and a lawyer, more about the post, and another archival producer, more about the post process. So if you have questions about that, you should come back. So here is a screenshot. This is proprietary, so please don't share this on social media. Um, I don't know why you would. <laughs> could go viral. Oh, a good, a good file maker screenshot, yes. Um, uh, thank you. I've developed this layout over the last decade, um, along with my company that's been doing this for a long time. Um, so uh, this is a little distorted down here. So when you are kind of what Judy was saying, um, when you're starting a project, what we do is we make a library basically from which editors and directors can take the best stuff that we've found to tell the story in the best way possible. When I'm starting a project, that's my goal. So um, by the end of this project, I'll probably have amount, about 10,000 records and 1,200 hours of footage. Um, there are probably going to be 25,000 photographs in our collection. Um, these all need to be logged. Um, they have metadata. They're entered into, we have a system now where we log in Avid and then export um, everything into FileMaker so it's searchable there. Um, so the most, I'm curious, Judy, what is the most important information to keep track of and why is it so important to have a system like this? And do you often work in FileMaker, spreadsheets? Yeah. No. I, I generally really require, if I do a big project, that the production invest in FileMaker Pro. You can, you know, there are people who do very elaborate tracking in Google Sheets and more power to them. I am old, I'm unwilling to change my systems because they really work for me. And Just, you know, this is something, a, a good database will serve you all the way through, including, you know, all of my final, does any, do people know what a visual cue sheet is? It's a deliverable on a documentary project, anything with third party, even a feature film. At the end of your project, you're going to have to deliver to whoever is distributing the film, to your network, um, a list that includes every single archival or third party element with information on how long it is, who you got it from, who owns the copyright, what rights you've obtained, what you paid for it, how long the term of rights is, et cetera. And if you have a good database, oh, sorry you can spit that right out of the database with, you know, with a lot of tweaking. So um, it's really important to know where did you get something? So that's Who the, owns the copy? That's the source up on there and the copyright. They're not always the same thing. Yeah. And sometimes you don't know who the copyright owner is and then you just have to put in a 
TBD or whatever you decide, but you need to be tracking what you know about the copyright from the very beginning. You have the archival reference number, which is the number that the archive assigns to it so that when you're ready to order a master, they know what to pull for you. Um, also, here we have MOS, which means there isn't sound, and then we have a checkbox for on-air talent. Can you talk about why that's important? Oh, yes, because on-air talent from a network, on-air talent from a network, or a feature film from a studio requires a very specific high level of clearance where you have to submit a, basically an overview of everything that you want to use, how long it is, the context in which you're using it. And the network will sometimes say, no, you can't use that that way. And you have to build time in for that process. So. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh yeah, date. I feel like a really nerdy Vanna White right now. There's the there's the date. Um, yeah, you can't really see, really see it. Anyway, um, I think that's a lot of the information. Um, Scott, why are these things important from an archival perspective? And and what are the different pieces of information that are important for you to know? Yeah, I mean, I think every place will be different as far as their ID numbers. Um, I mean, often those are embedded on screeners and things like that, but you do have to keep track of whatever IDs that um, are used from a, you know, from a, a source. Um, because when you do come to the point of ordering master material, this is what we want to license, this is what we want high quality masters, yeah, you have to su supply, you know, a, an ID that makes you know, sense to that particular archive, in and out time codes. I think it's always good, even in the digital age, to include a description of the shot because there's so many different shots people are using. It's always good to have a description just so everything we know kind of matches up when we go to the final mastering process. Um, but yeah, keeping track of the, the IDs are, are, you know, to identify what reel something came from, what screener something came from, you know, all that is, you know, crucial when you get to the end. So, you know, everyone's not uh, trying to figure something out uh, under deadline pressure. And I just want to talk a little bit about that number that's in the very upper, your left corner, which is... AF is Ali Film. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that it's worth assigning your own numbers to archival material is that that really helps to differentiate it in the timeline so that when you're trying to break down a cut, the assistant editors can really organize the timeline and you know turn it over to you and you know it's archival and you can always find it. When you just dump something in with its native number, it gets much harder to track. So it's all part of tracking. Yeah, and with that, um, try to not let your editors bring stuff in from YouTube or anybody bring things in from YouTube. I can't express that enough. It's very important that you know the source of things. And this is one way that we tend to keep track of that is that anything that goes into the timeline has, in this case, an AF number or Jackie Robinson, JR number, Roosevelt's R number, you know, whatever it is. And every project um, for us has a different system and that's how we keep track of everything. Um, I think let's watch the Edgeworks reel where we've been talking a lot about footage, and so let's see some. Awesome, thank you. Um, cool, so many great films in there. Yeah, and um, really, um, I think it's a good example of, you know, creatively, as a director, you know, if you really want to make a statement with your film, you know, there, there is a very wide world for you um, out there. It really is limited by your vision and sometimes by your budget, but I have to say that I think directors, especially documentary directors, get intimidated by graphics because they automatically think it's gonna to be too expensive um, or that it, you know, they're not, um, you know, it's just a scary process because to me, I, I kind of look at it as when I take my car to the mechanic, I have no idea how it is, you know, how my car works, and I immediately think that I'm gonna get bamboozled in some way. Um, and I feel like a lot of directors that haven't worked with graphics before approach us in this very suspicious, like, <clears throat> are you gonna cheat me out of my, you know, and it really is, um, we look at ourselves, I mean, I certainly, I before I got into visual effects, 
I was uh, a producer um, and a production manager on all kinds of different things. So I really understand, um, we understand your process um, and we look at ourselves as partners with you, um, you know, in your producing team in a lot of ways. So, you know, we are very willing to always have those conversations before you've even gone out and shot anything. I mean, a lot of our clients that we've worked with for years, they're talking to us before they've even gone out with a crew yet, um, just trying to get an idea. Um, and then sometimes, you know, you have someone like Stanley, who's obviously an auteur and has been doing this for a long time, and he knows exactly what he wants. Um, and, you know, they came to us, they were deep in their edit by the time they came to us. Um, but it, it can range, but I definitely encourage people that, especially if you haven't done it before, to talk to someone early, get a relationship going, you know, because phone calls don't cost you anything. Those conversations are, and they can really help you. We can really help you plan so that if you are raising money, you don't have to go back. Because no, you know, when you guys are out there raising money for this stuff, you um, don't want to go back to your investors a third, a fourth time because you haven't planned properly. You, if, if, you know, so I would just encourage that. And I'm just going to say, sitting here watching the reel, I realized that we just worked on something together, which was the PBS reconstruction series. But of course, we were never in contact. And, um, you know, something like that where the visual material is limited. I mean, we moved heaven and earth to find photographs. We had, in the end, we had something like 15,000 photographs from the period of 1860 up to about 1917, which represented lots of digging in tiny local archives. But for some things, all we had were newspaper articles or illustrations. And the, the image of the snake on the sword, that was something that came out of our production. I'm really bad at the microphone, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but also just seeing what they do with, with bringing a a piece of newsprint to life and animating it, that can really help to make your storytelling more emotional than just simply seeing the inanimate words. Yeah, and also so, so you're not getting lost in the in a lot of the text and the words, especially in reconstruction. There was you know, there's just there's a lot of talking and it really helps, I think, um, so that you're so that you are exactly, you know, keeping everyone engaged so they're not just staring either A, at a person that's constantly talking at camera, or you're just staring at, you know, uh, a block of text or, you know, information that's presented in this very static way. Yeah, I think at its best, you know, the archival that you find can really um, motivate the storytelling. Um, I think we're going to do questions soon, but I was hoping you two um, could talk a little bit about the archival, the archivist archive relationship and that the possibilities <laughs> of, of being in touch. Um, I will say it's so important if you're doing archival for the first time and you're trying to find something, you're usually under a deadline. The people on the archive side are people and they often really care about their collections and they can't necessarily help you for time constraints. I can't express enough the importance of just calling, being nice, um, and all of this stuff. I've, I've been, you know, just, just creating relationships with people. It's really important because these things, as Judy said with her example of the iPhone shot, you know, it often comes down to individuals, you know, they're not downloading something. It's like actually taking a physical element that's dusty and moldy and trying to get it to you in New York and they're in Arkansas or whatever it is. And so, yeah, that's that's just one of my little my little soapboxes. Send baked goods. Send baked goods. You know, thank oh, them, gosh. invite them. If you have a spring, I'm a real fan of Burdick's chocolates. <laughs> thank you. That's what I sent. So. Um, yeah, if you have a local screening, invite them. They're a huge part of the process, and and that's something that's so rewarding in my work is getting to know archivists because they're like nerdy in the best ways, and they really are passionate about where they're from. So yeah, if, if you could talk to that relationship a little bit. Yeah, well, Scott and I, we go way back. And I think that we, we really cemented our relationship in, in the 90s when I was working on tabloid Japanese TV <laughs> coverage of the Joan Benet Ramsey case. 
Whoa. And um, and I was working with Scott, and we were like pulling stuff that came in that morning. He was transferring it for me, and then we were satelliting it to Tokyo at eleven o'clock at night so that it could be on their well, I evening about news. That. Yeah, that was, but that was, and I was like, okay, yeah. this is a person I want to stay in touch with. So, but it is it is really true that you know. The way a wish list works, I think, is the wish list is your first idea of what you're going to use. And your wish list is not a static element in the process. It's something that moves and breathes and grows as you learn more about your story, as you learn more about what's there. And as you think about telling your story in something other than the first way that it occurred to you to tell and illustrate your story. And, you know, with Scott, um, we, you know, I have two projects that we're embroiled in. One is a feature film that has limited but very, very important archival elements, and the other is this Atlanta project. Um, and our communication is sometimes I'm looking for this very specific thing, but sometimes my communication with him is I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, except that it has to be in this ballpark. It has to have these kinds of elements. What do you have? And you know, that might be within the Vietnam War. I'm looking for. Um, you know, I'm looking for anything with the Confederate flag going by on a tank or a jeep or hung on a wall or something like that. Or, um, you know, we just got the most fantastic shot for this project from NBC to replace a shot for which another archive had lost the original film. And because it's a feature and we're doing new 4K scans of everything, you know, we can't have something that's only a bad SD video transfer from the 90s. And, you know, I said to Scott, here's what we have. I just need something else that does the same thing. And we got a shot that was better than the shot that we were using, which was a shot that one of the assistant editors had pulled under the gun, you know, eight months ago. So. Yeah, I know that, that was something, that particular shot was something that you know, one of our researchers in house was able to find, and you know, and that's you know something that like at our archive, I mean, we still have a, a, a pretty experienced research staff in house. I mean, so they're you know having an experienced researcher, you know, still has a lot of value. Um, I mean, if you're a first time you know filmmaker, maybe dealing with archival, I mean, you're you're looking at you know a lot of different companies' websites. You know, we have a website with with a lot of kind of curated clips, which is, you know, which is really good. And there's a lot of places with a lot of material out there. Um, but, you know, there is also, you know, another, which we've talked about a bit about, you know, this other side of the process, which, you know, there is still a lot of material, a lot of material, not on, you know, hasn't been digitized or, you know, hasn't, um, you know, been put on website yet. Um, and, you know, there's having a, you know, in-house researchers, Kind of understanding, you know, what you're going for on a particular shot. I mean, that's you know, it's, it's still really, um, you know, really helpful to have that. And and I think another really valuable part of a collaboration with an, a commercial archive like NBC is that you you know, especially if you've done a lot of prospecting on YouTube, when you get to your fine cut, and that's a point where you should really evaluate what you have in archivally you may find that you have 10 seconds from this place, 20 seconds from this place, a minute from this place, two seconds from this place, and every archive has a minimum. And so one of the things you can begin to do is consolidate, and you can also think about doing some kind of upfront commitment, and you can work out the details based on your cash flow of when you pay for what. But you know, if you can do a volume commitment up front, you can get much better pricing. And um, that's something, you know, in the series that I'm working on now, I'm really looking at, okay, you guys, you're taking this from here, but I actually, you know, editors will often grab the first thing that solves a sequence, and when you get to fine cut, that's the point to really look at. What else is there that would serve this? And, you know, we've been doing a lot of digging 
in the NBC archive on our series to find stuff that will work in the same way as you know, something that came in fast from another source. And again, we'll be um, talking with an, art, uh, with an editor, Maya Mama, um, at, at a panel later today, kind of getting into the weeds about the archival producer editor relationship, um, which is an interesting and <laughs> an interesting which, would, which ends up hopefully on a good on a project where it all works ends up being a total love fest, but it doesn't start that way. No, I, I worked with one editor who used to say to me when I came into the room, "You're com coming in here to tell me what I can't do," and I said, "No, I'm coming in to solve a problem that we both have." You know, like that's it. Um, well, with that, um, we're going to open up to questions. Um, one thing I want to say is, yeah, we're not going to be just discussing fair use at all. I'd love to stay within research, um, discussions of a research and kind of project planning um, specifics are good. So yeah, um, and I'm just going to repeat the question. So, Let me repeat that. Can I just repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this fine, I'm guessing producer here is hyper organized. And so a director said, hey, come on and do archival producing. Um, she pulled stuff for a project that's a, in current events um, and has a lot of news. Uh, they had an agreement worked out with ABC News. Um, ABC News recently changed its policy on licensing branded and on-air talent, whereby they're in only case, they're case by case basis, very rarely licensing at this point to anything that isn't owned by Disney. Um, this is, there are a lot of changing rules around who can use what um, from certain networks. I think, Scott, you can maybe, this might be a sticky subject, but you can maybe yeah, speak I, to this. I meet with the head of Comcast about this. You know. Thank you so much for doing that on behalf of the documentary filmmaking community. Um, no, and so it's it's sticky. It gets into streaming more stuff. It's like ABC only wants their content on Disney platforms. Um, so the question was about, hey Scott, can we work together on this? Uh, perhaps, and and that's just a really hard situation, and it definitely helps in that situation. Yeah, to have just so you feel better, it's it's something that our entire community is reeling from. The only thing is, at least we got a little notice because we were in that community that this was coming down the pike. But um, you know, the series I'm working on, we have an interview with the ABC reporter who covered the subject for three years and you know it's it's very I don't know how it's gonna go we're trying right now to replace anything where we don't have to have him and hoping that they'll make an exception because he's featured in it but you know this ha has happened in a different way earlier with the CBS archive where they made they made the cost of using their branded or on-air talent so expensive that and, and the process of getting screeners so cumbersome and expensive that you know a lot of us just started to avoid them really which is yeah i sad. It, it's sad i mean yeah it sometimes feels like with these big corporate uh groups that they're holding history hostage a little bit yes um yeah i don't know who clapped but yeah, yeah but it's, <laughs> it's really true um but yeah so i don't that scott do you want to speak to this I mean, at right all? now i mean yeah we're we're you know 
licensing our, our talent. And, Thank you. and um, so, yeah, I mean, in your particular case, if you're looking for like anchors from, you know, Lester Holt on the nightly news or something from MSNBC, yeah, we could you know, definitely look to see if we have, you know, similar type things. Um, you're, you know, that, it, the thing with ABC is Judy said is something that's that's like very very recent mm -hmm. kind of thing, and you know, uh, yeah, policies change at at large media companies, uh, you know, sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's that's an unfortunate one that you're kind of in the middle of, mm -hmm. you know, getting down to you know licensing. So yeah. you could have the animation company do recreations in a very interesting <laughs> way. <laughs> And recreate headlines for you, and you never have to go to the archivist. But if you're so fabulously well organized, you just get Scott's card and send him your list of you know dates and events. And you know, one thing about news is most most of the major news stories are covered yeah. by all the networks in some way. Right. I mean, right. When you get back into more into the definitely the film era you get into the 70s and 60s and 50s that's when archives as far as on the broadcast side you know they start to they start to vary as far as what was kept what wasn't kept uh, what that, kind of condition that's what condition in. they're in um you know most archives you know from the the 90s on i mean they usually have you know um, you know when things were were on tape out of the film era um and yeah they start covering a lot of the same you know same things and things are kept um you know just better but it's the older material that you know varies widely as far as what was what's accessible yeah thanks for your question and this is where i will also say your director is very lucky to have you and this is why you bring on archival producers so they can alert you early in a process like cosell is very important uh, for me, that's ABC Wide World of Sports. Um, so, you know, I, as soon as I got that news, started trying to negotiate and figure it out. And also sometimes, depending, um, you know, maybe they can broadcast on ABC or something. Like maybe some like larger partnership can be formed around uh, use of archival. Um, on the Jackie Robinson project, we had MLB early. Um, brought onto the project, they knew we were doing that's it. So Major we could, League Baseball. That's Major League Baseball, that baseball with Jackie Robinson, important uh, relationship to have. You know, we couldn't have made, we couldn't be making the Ali film without contacting ESPN, which has the largest, you know, so, yeah, um, maybe there's something that your directors can do that's kind of above um, what you're able to do as an archival producer. Or um, you could replace it all with NBC footage. That's still, <laughs> still a possibility. Um, good luck. Thanks for your question. Does anybody else have any questions here? Yeah, so you talked a little bit about those smaller archives where it's like one person in the boxes and then not finding a, um, and I'm in a similar situation. So other than building that relationship and like you said, reaching out and nourishing that relationship, I was wondering if you had any other specific advice about situations like that. Um, uh, so the question is about um, advice when you're working with smaller archives. Um, do you have anything, like, are you working specifically through any problem or looking for anything yeah, it's, specific? It's the idea that I feel like there might be footage hidden and he doesn't really have the manpower to go through every single Where's wow. What era? And whenever uh, you hire a careful producer, you definitely need to tell them, you know, like, what era are you working with and what area geographically are you working with? Because that really changes the workflow. So that's why I asked that question. Yeah, it's the Bay Area in the early 70s. Oh, cool. So she's working, she's looking for footage from the Bay Area from the 1970s, which happens to have this wonderful archive. Are you working with Alex Cherian at the, yeah, yeah, yeah he's awesome. awesome. Exactly There's the Bay Area TV yeah. archive. The Bay Area Television <clears throat> Archive, which has multiple stations, all of their film. And you know, and barely a lot of it barely cataloged. It's true. So, so the question is, um, yeah, how would we suggest going about that and making sure that I guess rocks are uncovered and perhaps you all have a story um, relating to that? Yeah, I mean, I can say I worked on the film about Angela Davis, Free Angela, and all political prisoners, and at the time the. Alex Cherian was very new at the Bay Area Television Archive. The woman who had been there for years had retired, and it was not 
well organized and even less well cataloged than it is now. And what we did is we really did a very, very deep specific dig on dates and locations for all kinds of stuff. And then we, I, I don't know if Alex still allows this, but we actually hired a local researcher who was armed with everything we'd found. And she went in and he did pull boxes in and let her look through stuff. Now, I don't know if that, you know, sometimes the rules, the access rules change. Um, also, if it's the Bay Area, are you also working with Sacramento History Center at all? Because there's a local news archive there um, that is, where, where it's really focused is when state officials would get involved in a story. So say, you know, for Angela Davis, there was a certain amount of coverage because Reagan, who was governor at the time, was very vocal in talking about what was going on. And so the Sacramento stations actually had cameras at the trial, at some of the Panther events up in the Bay Area to say nothing of actually covering Reagan when he was there. So you might also find something there. Um, and surprisingly, we found some stuff um, through Paul Lissy at eFootage who just had pri a, you know, a sort of stringer cameraman who had done some coverage of um, really of Angela's trial and just had some very, very beautiful shots. I mean, it was a small amount of material, but those are a few thoughts. Um, okay. Um, I'm working on a film um, where my main character was very famous um, in the 20s and 30s, and I have been prospecting on YouTube and found a lot of footage, but my question is about cost. What, what, what is a fair cost for worldwide rights for 30 seconds? Okay, so the question is about a fair, it's kind of a budget question about fair cost for worldwide use. Now I will say, um, anytime you go to license footage, sometimes even when you're doing research, archives will ask, what rights do you require? Um, we do worldwide, in perpetuity, all media. And that often excludes theatrical. So that's a really important thing as a producer or director to know what terms you're using because that really influences the cost of what you'll be able to do. And some archives only do for a 10-year term, and then you need, if you want to broadcast and use that material later, you need to renew uh, the copyright, or you need to renew the license for that material. Some um, allow you to use things in out-of-context promotion, which is important for, um, you know, if you're gonna show your clip on a you know, morning news show or whatever. Um, versus others don't. So it's important, we're, we're not really talking about the legal aspect, we're gonna be talking about that in the next panel, but just an important thing to keep in mind. So back to the question, what's a fair price? And, and can I ask, <laughs> are you actually thinking you only are gonna use 30 seconds? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, no. because what you really have to think about is no, not sorry. what is the price for 30 seconds, you have to think, you have to think about what kind of volume and what kind of deal right. you might be able to make because it really affects pricing. So for example, yeah, if you... I mean, if it's from Pathé or if it's from Reuters or if it's from Getty, So yeah, something it's that's something. more archival like Pathé, the pricing will be lower than it might be from Screen Ocean, which handles Reuters, where you'll have to do a lot more wheeling and dealing. But I mean, you can ask each archive, you can just get their book rate for 30 seconds through a simple email. You don't need to be in the dark. There's usually a contact page and you can simply ask. You know, the one thing I would just be really careful of is adding full theatrical rights makes something much more expensive in most cases. So if what you really need is all media except theatrical or all media except theatrical but including film festivals or all media except theatrical but including film festivals and an academy qualifying run, which is often important in a documentary, get clear on that because you really will get substantially lower pricing. And what, what a lot of places will do for, for indie doc filmmakers, which we do, if, you know, initially 
You can do a film festival license only, which is going to be a much lower price as you work for getting distribution. And then once you get distribution, then you can you know, upgrade that film festival license to an all media license. And if you're doing it within a reasonable amount of time, um, you know, usually you can pay the difference between what you've paid for the film festival license and what you've paid to upgrade to, a, to an all media license. Um, and, and the window on that generally varies. I mean, there are a few places that will only give you a three month window yeah. for a step up, which is really no help at all. Yeah. But you know, most places, if you stay, the important thing in that is to stay in touch and exactly. let people know. Yeah. We still don't have distribution, but you know, we're in talks with such and such. We think it's going to come through next August. You know, and if they know that, they can hold it open. But if if you just you know get your festival rights and let it drop. And then come back in 18 months and say, oh, we want to step up now, they'll probably say no. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where kind of sometimes the relationship helps or just the communication helps, on, especially with, with the indie doc, uh, you know, filmmaker. Um, yeah, exactly what Judy said, just like we're, you know, we, we need a couple more months on this, uh, you know, because we're getting close. And ultimately, you know, the, 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 the licensor wants to wants to do the upgrade to all media, um, you know, they want to see you get distribution, you know. So, um, you know, I, I find usually places will be a little flexible, but keeping in touch about that is, I think, important. And just quick numbers, I would say, if you're going for all media, but with some kind of, you know, only film festivals or only film festival and an academy run, that the the rack rate for only thirty seconds can range anywhere from a you know like a sort of vintage archive, like Streamline or Film Archive or or Pathé probably from about fifty to sixty dollars a second, and then for you know uh, Reuters or a news archive, you know probably more like eighty five to ninety. And if you're using any talent, although you wouldn't be from the 20s and 30s, you don't have to worry. So. Yeah, and then when you're using talent, it can be 150, 200. If it's sports, it can be $350. A, and this is per second, um, just keep in mind. So yeah, I, I definitely like the lowest, just $50 per second, that tends to yeah, be. And if you're using time lapse of a glacier flowing into the sea in Greenland, it can be $500 a second. So. You really do have to scope out, and, and don't be afraid to ask early when you find something. Figure out who owns it and ask them, and, you're and able start to working on them to give you a break. <laughs> yeah, and in FileMaker and in spread in in um, Excel, you can um, calculate a per second rate. Um, it's an important thing to do um, once you have an EDL. We have time for one more question. All right, they're in the center. Have you ever worked with? A painting, or like, how do you go about licensing an image of a painting? Great <laughs> question. Um, how do you go about? Have we ever licensed and possibly a painting? Animation, like what? What's our possibly sorry? then and visual effects as well? Okay, so the question is um, working with from loving <laughs> sure uh, <laughs> working with a painting. Um, how do you license a painting, um, and can you alter the image? And I think. In general, if it's okay, we can also talk about altering archival from a rights perspective, if that's an okay thing to do. I think some archives don't want you to alter the image and others do. So can you speak to the licensing of paintings? So most, you know, it really, and we're not talking about fair use here, but as you can see, I, or as you could have seen, I worked on The Price of Everything, which was a film about the contemporary art world. And for the most part, we made an argument that our use of the art was a fair use. And so, you know, that's what we did on that. That's for another panel. There are mechanisms for licensing paintings. Um, the Artists' Rights Society and VAGA are two organizations that represent vast, vast numbers of artists. And they are very cagey about giving you numbers up front. And I got very frustrated with them because I couldn't make a budget because they would not give me numbers to throw into a budget. So it made it very, very difficult to deal with. And that's an unusual situation. But 
if it's a specific painting and you have an idea of the scope and especially if it's a specific painting and you do want to animate or alter it in some way, I would start that conversation very early. If the artist is alive, is the artist alive? No. 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 The okay, when did the alive. artist die? 18. Oh, <laughs> oh the well then it's in the public domain, honey. You don't have a problem. You just need to get a good, you know, a high quality image. Do they have and an estate? Is it, is it privately owned or is it in a museum? I think it's privately owned, yeah. Yeah, so then you're going to have to deal with the owner to get a high quality image. But if you can find a high quality image, it's public domain. And sometimes finding the high quality image, like if something is a large painting and needs to be, you know, photographed or filmed or scanned in a specific way, that can be a very, you know, expensive process because you're dealing with a, you know, the the scan of a physical work that's likely very delicate and that would require a specialized group of people to do that. I'm probably going to photograph it and then scan the photograph. If yeah. there How do you want to animate it? I mean, what, or do you want to actually move the image itself? Yeah, there's, there's ships, I guess, like to, you know, I guess, bring this yeah. thing to life. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we've actually done a couple, we've done a few films with art. Um, we did a film called Unraveled um, about this guy, Mark Dreyer, who was kind of like a Bernie Madoff, um, and he had this incredible art collection, um, and all of his work was repossessed, and we basically created um, a 3D version of, we took photographs of his apartment and recreated his apartment and put the paintings back on the wall, basically. Um, but we didn't manipulate those images. Um, we have, we are currently working, well, we just finished a documentary with a young painter where we actually had the permission to animate his actual imagery and incorporate it into the film. Um, so, and we, we actually work with a lot of illustrations you could see in our reel where, you know, we're moving things. Um, so you can do it. It's a matter of permission. Um, and certainly I, we don't, <laughs> if you tell us we have permission, we can, you know, uh, dive in creatively. So we have to trust the producers just, just to be clear to all of you about all of that end of it. When you start working with archival, we are assuming that you have the rights. In fact, it's in our contract always that it's your responsibility to have the rights on imagery that we're working on. And uh, because obviously we, you know, can get ourselves into trouble if we're, you know, dealing with imagery that you didn't get the rights for. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind um, when you're dealing with any kind of visual treatment on the archival that you're buying. An alteration of archival material, whether it's moving images because people sometimes separate and create a 3D effect or it's a still photograph or a painting, you can never ever assume without asking that what you want to do is okay. You really do have to ask. I mean, I worked with an archive on reconstruction where we were not even allowed to repair a tear that ran down the center of Actually, the photograph. Actually, remember. Yeah, and, it, and they were just very stringent because they really felt that, you know, and it was a, a podunk state historical society that was only charging us $15 to use the image, but they were adamant and we couldn't, we could not retouch the image at all. So it's just something to be aware of. And, you know, when people own something, they own it and they have a right to make their own rules. And the only thing you can do when you don't like the rules is do your best to negotiate something that's more in line with what you want. But you know, you can't assume that it will happen. And then you send them chocolates at the end of the project. Um, Sometimes you send them chocolates before. <laughs> so with that, we actually ran over a little bit. I'd like to thank Scott, Cassandra, and Judy. Um, I'd like to thank Stephanie for being such a great moderator. Come back this afternoon if that wasn't enough information for you. Um, and we'll be around if you want to talk to us and have any questions. Thank you.